This is C-SPAN's Afterwards podcast. This week, New Yorker staff writer Patrick Radden Keefe reports on the Sackler family's wealth that was built on pharmaceuticals, including Valium and OxyContin. His book is called Empire of Pain, The Secret History of the Sackler Family. He's interviewed by author and journalist Beth Macy. Congratulations on the stunning success of Empire of Pain. Um, you have really hit it out of the park. Uh, the reviews have been fantastic, and no wonder. Uh, in my view, uh, not as only as someone who has um, written a book about the opioid crisis, but also someone who has spent a lot of time with families impacted by it, um, you've written a riveting narrative that's a masterclass in investigative journalism. You've not only dug into the documents, you've interviewed the doormen, the yoga teachers, the secretaries, the lawn care folks, some of whom themselves were addicted to OxyContin. Um, Empire Pain is an immigrant story and a family saga, but at its core, it's also a page turner about who wields power in America. Um, A reviewer in New York Magazine, uh, Sarah Jones, I thought really nailed it when she said, Um, in her beautiful review of your book. She wrote, this country concluded long ago that it would trade the public good for whatever largesse its tycoons would shed. And she's, of course, referring to the rent-seeking behaviors of corporations like Purdue, as well as regulatory failures that repeatedly kneecapped the FDA and the DEA, who were supposed to be watching out for consumers. So I was hoping we could begin there. And you've said before, quoting, I think, John Oliver, that the way to hide evil is to cloak it in something boring. Can you talk about why you framed the story the way you did? Oh, well, first of all, Beth, thank you so much for, for doing this. It's, it's a real honor to be talking with you. Um, you know, as the author of, of Dope Sick, I, I, I feel as though I'm, I'm really kind of following in your footsteps here. Uh, and it's a tremendous book. And um, I know you're working on a new one. And so it's, uh, it's always fun to get to come out and talk about your book. But to talk about it with somebody who knows the story as well as you do uh, is a real treat. So thanks for doing this. Um, it's interesting. I mean, that John Oliver line, I think about that all the time that, you know, he said, if you want to do something evil, wrap it in something boring. And I think what he's getting at is that we live in a, in a society where there's a great deal of complexity. And sometimes it's just hard to figure out what's going on with a particular story, particularly, I think, if it intersects with the legal system or the financial system. Um, you know, if you read the coverage in the business pages, sometimes it's a little hard to, to kind of see the forest for the trees. And, um, one thing I think about a lot as a writer is kind of subverting that is taking situations that are maybe innately very complex, forbiddingly complex, so complex that, that some readers might just be kind of inclined to check out. And making the challenge for myself, you know, can I turn this into a great story? Is there a way to translate the complexity into a narrative that that has a kind of hook that will grab people? And um, so for me, I, you know, part of the reason I was interested in the Sackler family is I'm interested in family stories. I think family dynamics are interesting. Um, I've written about families before, uh, but I also thought that this was an opportunity to kind of tell a story that's a story about the opioid crisis, about big pharma, about the, I would argue, the kind of corruption of medicine by money. Um, but tell it in the form of a family saga, you know, something that, that I hope is, is pretty approachable, um, both for people who may have been touched by the opioid crisis, may have some personal prior connection to this, or also for people who, who don't, you know, who don't, who've never read an article about the opioid crisis, don't feel like, um, you know, there, there aren't that many people who aren't directly or indirectly touched at this point, but, but, but they're out there. And um, I wanted to try and find a way to engage those people as well. Yeah, absolutely. That reminds me, I have a little quote on my computer here that I think of a lot. The safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot without sudden 
turnings, without milestones, without signposts. That's C.S. Lewis. And I think of that as I think of the metaphor of the boiling frog too, you know, and which I compare to the opioid crisis because there have probably been tens of thousands of articles written going back to the early crime stories with Oxycontin and then all the many lawsuits, all the many stories of families who've been impacted by it and now this bankruptcy. So what you've done, and I tried to do this in my first book, Factory Man, Mm -hmm. Uh, my agent said, which was about the aftermath of globalization told through a furniture maker, it was also a family saga, uh, who had sued China and the Court of International Trade to keep its factory going and kind of help save the town. But my agent had said to me, uh, when I started that, he said, uh, I want you to write a book that would explain globalization to your mother, right. you know, who had been a displaced factory worker herself. Mm. And I always think about that. And I think that's what you've done as well. It's like, maybe you didn't read those tens of thousands of articles about so many different complex issues with the opioid crisis, but it's so easy to get into this one family story and just become totally involved in it. Um, and then not only that, but you, you broke so much news in it. One of, one of the many stories you on earth was one I hadn't heard before um, was a family secret story about Mortimer Sackler's son, Bobby Sackler, who committed suicide during a mental breakdown. Um, can you tell us how you learned of that story? And um, I'm particularly interested because it relates so much to stigma, um, as the OxyContin founder, Richard uh, Sackler, once famously said, when stories about overdoses come up in the press, we should hammer on the abusers. And so I think there's, you know, just a lot of story in your book about stigma, but that one really, really um, kind of showed that, you know, no family was immune from it. So I wonder if you could tell us about that story. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, um, I mean, there's a couple of things there. So just, just by way of context for, for people who may not know the story or have read the book, the, um, Purdue Pharma, this company owned by the Sackler family, releases OxyContin in 1996. And um, the company and the family have long claimed that they didn't know that there were any real problems until four years later when they started. They only knew when they read about it in the press that people were abusing OxyContin, uh, growing addicted to it, overdosing, dying. And one thing I, I was able to pretty conclusively demonstrate in the book is that that's not true. Actually, they knew long before 2000 um, and actually not too long after the drug had been released that this drug that they had been promoting as impossible to abuse, as not addictive, uh, actually was was causing real problems for a lot of people. Um, And the response from the family and the company is really interesting because I do think that another family, another company might have had a moment of alarm <clears throat> and said, wait a second, we, we've got to take a hard look at what we're doing here and not necessarily pull the drug from the shelves, but like, look at their marketing, look at the claims that they were making about the drug, look at how aggressive they were being in promoting it and, and ask, are we contributing to this problem? And they didn't do that. What they did instead was they basically said, you know, there's two kinds of people. There's legitimate pain patients who are taking this pain medication that we sell and they never have a problem. They never get addicted. They take it as directed. They're responsible. They're good citizens and they should have access to the drug. And then there's drug abusers. And these are people who, you know, if they weren't using Oxycontin, they'd be using heroin or cocaine or uh, some other prescription pills Um, they're bad people. Uh, you know, Richard Sackler in particular, this is a second generation Sackler who was very instrumental in the, um, development and promotion of Oxycontin. You know, he said they're the scum of the earth is what he said. Uh, they're not victims, they're victimizers. And that has long been the position of the, the family and the company that, um, you know, it's not the, it's not the pills that are a problem. It's the people who are abusing them. And one of the things I, I thought about in, in 
writing the book was how, how do you write about victims? You know, how, what are the narrative choices you make in terms of describing the fallout of the drug? And a, a lot of prior books had done this by spending a lot of time with, you know, one character or a handful of characters who find that they're, they're using Oxycontin and then they're having problems with it. And then they start, uh, you know, getting hooked and <clears throat> maybe buying it on the black market and overdosing. And you sort of follow the story of these people. And I think it's good to spend a lot of time in, in those kinds of narratives, but I also felt as though that was an approach that had been taken. Um, by the time I started writing, taken very successfully by other writers and other books. Um, what I was really interested in was the idea that I wanted to kind of tell just in passing the stories of lots and lots of people who had struggled with Oxycontin, but I always wanted them not to be like somebody disconnected from the central narrative. My thing was like, where are they in relation to the Sacklers? Where are they in relation to Purdue? So there's a story I tell fairly early on about a sales rep who I wrote about this guy, Stephen May, and he has a doctor who's a big prescriber and he goes and he visits her. And one day she's, she's really ashen and, and un, unhappy. And he, he asks what the problem is. And she says that she has a relative who's just overdosed and died from Oxycontin. And this is a doctor who's a big prescriber of the drug. Um, there's a woman who's a legal secretary at Purdue Pharma who works on the same floor as the Sacklers who I described, and she gets hooked on Oxycontin. And so I was trying to kind of, situate these people as close to the company and the family as I could to show that, you know, it's not just some remote person who they would never meet. Like it's somebody who works on the same floor as you. And I had a hunch, which is that just statistically, like somebody in the Sackler family had to have struggled with addiction. It had to, I mean, there's so many of them that it just makes sense that somebody would have had to. Um, but I, you know, I, I asked around a lot. That was like this theory that I had. And um, I couldn't really get any answers. And then I, I can't tell you, I'm afraid exactly how it came to me, but a source told me uh, there was one of the Sacklers who committed suicide in 1975. Um, his name was Bobby Sackler. And he was the son of Mortimer Sackler, who was one of the, the two brothers who ran Purdue Pharma for years, Purdue Frederick, as it was called then. And um, I started asking around and I, I spoke to a friend of his mother's who said, oh, he had a drug problem. And then I found a, um, a deposition that Kathy Sackler, his sister had done in which she talks, you know, it's the kind of thing you might not pay any attention to unless you knew this piece of information where she's talking and she was talking about the heroin crisis in the seventies. And she was like, I mean, I had friends relatives who struggled with this. Um, and then she moves on. She doesn't say anything particular about her brother. But the weird thing for me was that Bobby had been kind of erased. Like he, there was no history about him anywhere, no memorials, you know, there's a grave, which I found. Um, but I kept pushing and eventually I tracked down the doorman who was on duty the day that he died at the building where he died, who actually um, witnessed him when it, Bobby Sackler jumped out of a window. And, and died on the sidewalk and, and the doorman who was there that day and spoke to his mother in the hours afterwards. And then I tracked down a housekeeper who'd worked for the family for th three decades, actually. And she was kind of called in to help take care of things um, in the immediate aftermath of that. So <clears throat> it was this very, very tragic story. Um, but what was so striking to me about it was that this family had been stigmatizing people who struggle with addiction for decades and they had this secret in their own past. And it was so telling to me that this family that is so kind of um, driven to put the family name up, to memorialize the Sackler name everywhere. Um, they didn't do anything to memorialize Bobby Sackler. You know, it's just like he disappeared. There was nothing yeah. about his life. So that, that to me was very telling. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you first wrote about the family for the New Yorker in 2017. I mean, that was a great piece that went on to inspire Nan Golden's um, protest activity, which has um, spawned a lot of interest in accountability and justice, I think. It's really made a big impact. Um, I know you got a lot of pushback from the family back then. 
And um, I wondered if you could talk about that and what kind of pushback you're getting now. You say towards the end of the book, give examples of how they tried to intimidate you. So I wrote this piece originally in 2017 for The New Yorker. And I, I, you know, what was different about that piece from what had come before was that I was not the first person to write about the Sacklers by any stretch. Um, Barry Meyer in The New York Times um, had written about them in his book, Painkiller, which came out in 2003. Um, Sam Quinones had uh, written about them in his great book, Dreamland, which came out, I think, in 2015. Um, and but, but, but in both of those books, the Sacklers are like one strand of a kind of multi-strand narrative. They're like one strand of a tapestry. And I was just amazed when I started looking into it that they they kind of still had their good name. Like it hadn't caught up with them, even though it was out there in the public record that they owned this company and were, I thought, implicated in- You couldn't even find their names on the Purdue website, could you? On the website. I mean, it was this amazing, to me, it was this con job where part of what this family's been so good at for decades, going back to the 1950s, is marketing. And in some ways, the greatest con they ever pulled was to write the family- out of the history of the family business. And I think I was just kind of astonished that even after Barry Meyer's book and even after Sam Quinones' book, it just didn't seem to have caught up with them. Like all kinds of institutions were still taking their money and putting the sacred name on things. And so what I wanted to do was write a piece where there was like, there's kind of nowhere to hide, you know, like you couldn't, you couldn't sort of hide over in the corner because the family was just there center stage. Um, and they, you know, I requested interviews. Um, they wouldn't talk to me. <clears throat> they were very, I have since learned that this is like very classic Sackler, but <laughs> they were like very kind of, mysterious isn't even really the word because you realize it seems mysterious at first and then you realize it's just, it's it's actually more kind of incompetence. But the, um, <laughs> but like there would be these press flacks who would, who I would talk to and I'd say like, well, which Sacklers are you representing? And they wouldn't tell me, this is a big thing. This is like a, oh a very God. kind of continuous thing where you, yeah, there's like a lawyer or a press flack and they're, they're being very officious. And then you say, okay, well, just to be a hundred percent clear, like who are your clients? Who do you represent? And they, it's as if they're, they're like not authorized to tell you even who they, who they're working on behalf of. And this is significant because the family is not a monolith. They, there are different factions and they don't always get along or agree. Um, but they never talked to me. I thought they would give a statement for the article, just like a one line, like, you know, there is an opioid crisis and it makes us very sad, but we're not responsible for it. Um, they didn't even bother to do that. Uh, it was, um, I have since seen some of the internal uh, email traffic that's been shared with me where they discussed um, my piece. And I think they, you know, I think some of them were worried and others sort of thought, eh, this guy's got nothing. Um, uh, you know, this will be a flash in the pan. So they just kind of blew me off. Um, the piece came out. The company asked for a few corrections, which we didn't make. Uh, you know, we looked into them and didn't make them. But the family actually didn't respond after the piece came out. Um, I now know that that the piece was a real problem for them, though, because it it um, one of the reviews of the book recently said something about how like the the New Yorker magazine is kind of the you know it's like the it's like the uh, the house organ of the kind of people that the Sacklers surround themselves with. I mean, I think there was probably some sense in which um, having the piece come out in the New Yorker made it harder because it's a magazine that a lot of people in their world read. Um, and I should say there was an article in Esquire that came out at almost exactly the same time, also about the Sacklers. So they had this kind of one-two punch. Um, but they were silent. They didn't say anything. The family didn't. Um, and at the time, I didn't have any intention of writing a book. And then in early 2019, <clears throat> Maura Healy, the attorney general of Massachusetts, did something that nobody had done up to that point. Um, pretty much every state in the union was suing Purdue. Uh, Maura Healy became the first 
attorney general to sue individual members of the Sackler family. And she had an amazing legal complaint with a lot of new material in it. And at that point, I thought, oh, I'm going to write a book. And um, that's when the campaign really started. So at that point, when it was announced that I was doing this book, um, the, the Raymond Sackler family, so one wing of the family, engaged a lawyer uh, named Tom Clare, who he kind of specializes in like trying to intimidate journalists um, and kill stories before they get written. That's his thing. Um, he's kind of real, uh, a real murderer's row of, uh, clients over the years. Um, and he started sending me nasty letters, um, demanding changes to the New Yorker article, which at that point was, you know, was like almost two years old. Um, the New Yorker actually engaged a fact checker to recheck the piece using his, his 15 page letter as a roadmap and they didn't make any, any corrections at all. Um, and threatening to sue me. And that never really let up. Um, they've been pretty quiet the last few weeks. They've been quiet since the book came out. Um, I'm sure we'll be hearing from them again in due course, but, um, you haven't gotten a letter more personal and confidential from Tom Clare. Exactly. And always, and it's always not, you know, it, it always says like not for publication as if, um, so that was something he, he, uh, I, I quoted it. I quoted in my book, a number of letters that he <laughs> told me were not for publication. Um, but, uh, so have you even heard back channels, what they think of it? No, I haven't. I haven't. I mean, look, I think that, the, you know, in some ways, a part of what this book is about is denial. And the idea that um, you have this family that uh, I think at a certain point just kind of detached from reality. And the world was trying to tell them in many, many, many different ways, like, you've made a terrible mistake, a series of terrible mistakes. And I think that they, decades ago, got incredibly good at kind of spinning to themselves and at surrounding themselves by lackeys and lawyers and yes men and spin doctors who would tell them, oh, you know, you've done nothing wrong here. You're just misunderstood. Um, and the crazy thing is it's like as the years go by and more and more and more people die and more lawsuits happen and more states sue the company and the company pleads guilty to federal crimes and then it pleads guilty to federal crimes again. And the family, you know, pays $220 million to settle civil charges without acknowledging any wrongdoing. It's one of these funny things where it's like, I think it gets harder and harder. I mean, it has to get harder and harder to sustain the fantasy that like, that you're right. Actually, like you've never done anything wrong. This is just a bad PR narrative. All these people are wrong about you and they've all been wrong about you for all this time. And you and never- will be vindicated. You hear that a lot. Vindicated in the end. I mean, this is the thing. They, their thing with, with me and with everybody else, they've been saying for the longest time, so, you know, for context, and Beth, you know this better than anyone, um, there's been a huge amount of documents that have come out uh, showing the way in which the, some of the Sackler family members um, kind of maniacally intervened in their company, Purdue Pharma. And these documents do not look good for the family. And one of the things that was kind of funny for me along the way is there's a statement that some of the Sackler representatives keep making where they say, you know, when the documents, when all the documents come out, you know, there's these documents that actually are totally exculpatory. And you'll see when these documents come out that haven't come out yet, that the Sacklers acted ethically and appropriately at all times. And when I was working on the book, I, I went to them and I said, you know, hey, guys, like, why wait? Like, I'd love to see those documents now. There's all these bad documents out there for you. If you've got these good documents you're sitting on, I'd, lo I'd love to see those. And um they hilariously, they wouldn't give them to me. They were like, we don't trust you. And we wouldn't give you privileged access to new materials is what they said. But I, it, it, it came to remind me a little bit of, you know, Donald Trump's tax returns, right? That he was always saying that like, as soon, just as soon as that audit is over, the tax returns are going to come out and they're going to be beautiful. beautiful. Uh, yeah. It was uh, a little hard to, to credit. $750. Um, okay, I've got a reporting question that I want to intro with uh, one of our favorite writers, Robert Caro, tells this famous story about um, he was had written 
um, so much about the LBJ. And after decades of studying LBJ, he was looking at this photograph. It's that iconic photo of the moment where um, LBJ is being sworn in on Air Force One and the day of the assassination of JFK and Jackie's there. And he's interviewed every single person in the photo. And finally, he realizes there, were one, there was one person he hadn't interviewed. And it was the photographer who wasn't in the photo. So he looks up his number, he calls him, he's in Florida. His wife answers the phone. He says the ultimate understatement. My name is Robert Caro and I write books about Lyndon Johnson. And she says, he's been waiting his entire life for you to call. And um, so you've got so much of uh, what Caro calls turn every page, turn every damn page. I, I just wondered, like, if you could take us to a couple of those most wonky in the weeds discoveries that people like you and me, like, it's really our jam. What were the what were the goodies in in your research process in this, and how did you find them? I mean, boy, there were so many. Um, the um, you know, there's a moment in the book that um, it's it's one of those things that. Uh, if I were writing fiction, I would not even use it because it would feel too kind of overbroad, too on the nose. It's so perfect. It's like too perfect. Um, but the beauty of writing nonfiction is, you know, the truth is what it is. And so I had um, Arthur Sackler, the original three Sackler brothers were very secretive. Um, I mean, all the Sacklers are very secretive there aren't a ton of interviews that they've ever given about their business or their lives. And Arthur gave more interviews than his brothers did, but not many at all. And I thought I knew all the interviews, but I also felt like probably there are some out there hiding. I mean, one thing I think about a lot as a reporter is that there's, there's like the internet and then there's everything else. And um, I think there is a tendency these days the, the tools that we have available to us make it so easy to, you know, find things that are on Google. And, and then, you, you know, you push a little deeper and you're on Nexus and ProQuest and newspapers.com. And, and, but like, once you kind of get to the, once you've sort of plumbed all the available, like at your fingertips, subscription-based archives, um, there's still a huge amount of stuff that just hasn't been digitized. And, um, I figured out at a certain point that Arthur Sackler had given money to Tufts in the 1980s, Tufts University, um, for the, the construction of a new I think it was a library. <clears throat> and there were, there was like a week of festivities, kind of black tie events. And I figured maybe there's something there. And so I was trying to figure out what are the student publications at Tufts? Um, and I ended up finding, uh, I think it's the Tufts Criterion. It's this kind of, you know, Tufts University newspaper and finding, um, you know, somebody, somebody it was like an archivist who I think found it on microfilm and then made a PDF of this special issue and sent it to me. And sure enough, there was this one page interview with Arthur Sackler that he gave to like some Tufts student journalist in the eighties in which he tells all these amazing stories that he, were never told anywhere else. And one of them is this story where he talks about how at the height of the great depression, his father, Isaac Sackler kind of loses everything and he gathers his sons around him. And he says, you know, I'm not going to be able to pass on an inheritance, give you any money. You know, you, if you're going to become doctors, you have to finance your own education. But the one thing I am giving you is the most important thing a parent can give their child a good name. And, it, you know, and what he meant by that was like a name that has integrity and that stands for doing the right thing and for honor. And he tells them, I mean, the quote, it's just like you couldn't make this stuff up. He, he says to his sons during the Great Depression, if you lose a fortune, you can always earn another fortune. But if you lose your good name, you can never get it back. And that was one of those things for me where it just it's suddenly like everything comes into focus because the first part of it is that that explains in some fundamental way that I, that I hadn't been able to explain before the passion that this family has really starting in the 1950s, just a couple decades later, as soon as the brothers start making money for putting their name up, 
you know, the kind of veneration of the family name. And then the other side of it is, is it, it, it kind of gives you your ending, right? Is that like, this is a story in which there's not a lot of accountability. Like the bad guys kind of get away with it in the end. But to me, there's this um, just kind of mind boggling irony, right? Which is that they, he told them the integrity of the name is most important. The fortune is not. Yeah. And they, and they got it exactly wrong. You know, they got it exactly wrong. They went for the fortune and they sacrificed the name and I don't think they're ever going to get the name back and the good name back. And, and um, so that was one of those moments where you just, it's kind of a flyer. Like I didn't know if there was going to be anything there. And um, the whole interview was. Did you even know you're going to write about Isaac at that point that much? I mean, I knew, I knew that he would come in briefly, but I didn't know. I mean, there's a, the, the thing about that scene is it's like, I think of it as like a rosebud kind of moment yeah. in Susan Kane, where it's like, it's this key that sort of unlocks something. Um, so that was a, that was a really amazing experience. I'm trying to think of some of the others. Was I mean, that early like, on in the process you found that? Yeah. So that would have been sometime in 2019. Cause I was, I was a lot of the work that I did initially was archival. Um, and you know, the, a lot of the Sackler brothers would never have left their letters anywhere, but I found that they, because they were so secretive, but they, um, they had like VIP friends. Like they were friends with the kinds of people who, when they die, donate their papers to universities. And so, um, there, you know, University of Rochester, Yale, Princeton, University of Texas, um, there were all these different, um, uh, archives at universities that I ended up accessing and finding really amazing stuff. The hard thing for me was that then COVID hit. Um, uh, and, and basically it was like last February, March, I would, I was like two or three archives shy of being done with my archival stuff. So to this day, there are these amazing letters that I know exist. Like I know the box, I know the folder and I haven't been able to access them. Uh, it kills me. Paperback. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> did, did, I mean, it must have been really hard writing about something that is presently in the news all the time. Um, as the litigation grew more complex and the company went into bankruptcy and the Sacklers tried to take advantage of that bankruptcy, even though they themselves aren't bankrupt, was it, how did you deal with uh, writing about something that was a moving target like that? Yeah, I mean, the, the, it was really hard to have it happening in, in real time. Um, uh, and a lot of the stuff to go back to our John Oliver conversation, like a lot of the stuff that was happening is just really complicated. So I think some of it for me was how do you tell this story? I think I had a frustration to be honest with you where, um, you know, by way of background for people who don't know, you know, so you have this company that's pled guilty twice to federal criminal charges and this family that owns the company that hasn't really had to face much in the way of consequences. And we now know that um, as the prospect of more and more lawsuits uh, um, becomes a kind of a threat (coughs) on the horizon, the family very quietly starts pulling money out of the company. $100 $100 million here, $300 million there. They take $10 billion out of the company to, in total. And then what happens is that at this point, now you've got like 2,500 lawsuits against the company and the family says, ah, too bad. Company doesn't have any money anymore. And they kick it into bankruptcy. So sorry about those lawsuits. Company doesn't have the money. You know, it, it might've had uh, $11 billion um, to with which to settle these lawsuits or fight these lawsuits. But the family had quietly siphon so much money out of it that they say, oh, there's nothing left. And they kick it into bankruptcy and keep the money. Um, And I think part of the frustration for me was that you had this bankruptcy process playing out and the daily press coverage of it was like written mostly by reporters who cover bankruptcy hearings. And you had these highly specialized bankruptcy lawyers and this bankruptcy judge who, um, you know, if you've read the book, I suffice it to say, I don't think he has, covered himself himself in glory in terms of uh, how he's how he's handled this case. Robert Drain, bankruptcy judge in, in uh, White Plains, New York. And I, I think that's, you know, it's not really their fault. It's just that these are these are bankruptcy people. So for them, everything's about efficiency. It's like, how can we how can we come up with the most efficient solution? And it's very insular. It's all the same players, which you describe so well. 
It's incredibly incestuous. Like the bankruptcy bar, it's a lot of these repeat players. They've all appeared before this judge before. To me, and I say this as somebody who actually trained as a lawyer myself, like I think it's kind of incredibly self-regarding if you... If you if you dial into these hearings, it's like all this talk about the incredibly hard work we've been doing on this very complex thing. And, you know, they're all billing millions of dollars a month. Um, and there's all this. They all make these noises about they all pay lip service to the idea of like, of course, we're all thinking about the victims here. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there are so many moments where the the judge, I think, could have. um could have allowed some of those victims to speak, you know, there are these marathon hearings and, and these guys make these very kind of casual invocations of the victims. Um, but, you know, on the opportunities, when, when there were moments where those victims actually broke in and tried to speak, um, they were basically told, you know, uh, now's not your time. You know, you're, you're not calendared for today. Um, we've got important legal business to get to here. Um, and, so I think some of it for me was trying to figure out how do you tell that story in a way that is explicable to readers um, and in a way that where you can, you don't lose the forest for the trees, because I think that um, there's a lot of complexity. Uh, but I also think that these, these issues are pretty elemental, right? There's almost a kind of, I think of myself, almost, it's, it's like at times you have to be like the kid in the emperor's new clothes, so for me, it's like, okay, so we got a company in bankruptcy. We got all these lawyers and this judge all kind of trying to carve up what's left of Purdue Pharma. And then sitting on the sidelines is this family that has more than $10 billion that they took out of the company. The whole reason they're all fighting over scraps in the bankruptcy is that this family took $10 billion out of it. And the idea that that wouldn't be like a kind of big threshold issue that everybody was talking about all the time and instead is just something that they all kind of take for granted. And it's like, Oh, well, this, you know, so it goes, yeah. um, uh, seems crazy to me, insane to me. And, um, so part of it for me was like, how do you, how do you bring that? How do you, how do you bring some of that absurdity out in a way that, um, right. that appreciate it. I mean, and, and they totally do. I mean, you've got that great quote from David Sackler, I think from 07 saying we're rich now, but for how long, like get ready, it's coming. I mean, that's so buttoned down in your arguments. Well, and the crazy thing is, and then literally you have some of the same Sacklers who, you know, <clears throat> have said, um, have said publicly, like, there was no way we could ever have predicted that there would be lots of lawsuits. And then it's like, well, what about this email where you said there are going to be lots of lawsuits? <laughs> I mean, this is the thing that's so crazy about the story is that they, is that each of the talking points that they have kind of rolled out ends up undermined by their own emails that end up getting produced. So it's just like one lie after another. And I can tell you from experience, having gone to, um, Purdue Pharma, but also the Sacklers themselves with many, many, many queries where I'm like, I'm like, you know, you said this, but how do you reconcile that with this email, which seems to say something different? They never respond to those questions, right? They never, ever, ever are like, oh, you know, let us explain the discrepancy. They always just punt on those, which I think yeah. is pretty revealing. Or they blame the abusers, which is me and you. Right. Like, right. Or, or, right. In my case, they, you know, yeah. they, they sort of impugn my integrity. Yeah. 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 So we've got at least 500,000 dead from the opioid crisis, probably many more. Um, we've got at least 2.6 million Americans addicted. And um, this is a question from Ed Bish who I think you wrote about and I write about. He lost his 18-year-old son, Eddie, to an Oxycontin overdose way back in 2001 and then has spent all of pretty much the following 20 years fearlessly trying to hold Purdue and the Sacklers accountable ever since. So Ed would like to know, um, and this is a question he wrote, um, we know now that in 2007, a prosecution memo calling for jail time was buried by the DOG, DOJ brass. And we know how the DOJ made a big deal about it being a record fine, $634 million. But no one went to jail. 
And Purdue and the Sacklers then went on to turbocharge sales, in the words of uh, their consultants, McKinsey. Um, in 2020, Ed reminds us, Purdue pleaded guilty to yet more felonies, not unlike the first ones. Why do you think there's almost zero chance still that the Sacklers will end up in jail and or giving uh, a large part of their fortune uh, back? It's a great question, um, and uh, and Ed, thanks for asking. Thanks for asking it, and thanks for your work um, over all these years. I mean, I, I I do quote Ed in the book, and um, and I think that the kind of tenacity uh, of some of these these parents who've lost children, um, these these other activists who've lost loved ones, yeah. um, people who are recovering from addiction themselves over the years in trying to hold this company and this family to account uh, is, is really part of the reason that people like Beth and I can do what we do. Um, you know, people like Ed were on this uh, long before I ever showed up to the story. So thank you. Um, yeah, you know, it's funny. There's a, there's a quote in the book from Arlen Specter, who uh, was the late uh, Republican Senator from Pennsylvania. And after Purdue does this deal in 2007, in which um, basically they they kind of go over the heads of the federal prosecutors to the Department of Justice in Washington and get the idea of felony charges dropped against these three Purdue executives. Um, so it ends up being just a fine and misdemeanor charges for those for those execs. Arlen Specter has this amazing line where he says, you know, I worry that if you're just fining a company, a company that makes like billions of dollars a year doing something, if you're just finding them, uh, I worry it's not going to change their behavior. That if you don't introduce jail time, you're not going to change behavior. And what our inspector said back in, in uh, 2007 was, I worry that a fine for a corporation is just an expensive license for criminal misconduct. And it's funny because, you know, when I started writing about Purdue in 2017, their whole rap then was they were like, oh, you know, we had a few bad apples, a little unpleasantness back in 2007. That was the extent of it. We really got religion after that. We had amazing compliance. You know, we had a corporate integrity agreement. Um, and of course, I now know from my reporting that that was all hooey, right? They didn't really change their behavior at all. They kind of doubled down on this behavior. Um, there's a quote that I have in the in the book uh, from somebody who who witnessed um, the CFO of the company speaking about that six hundred million dollar fine, saying, "Please, that's nothing to us. We've had that in the bank for years." Um, so this was not a deterrent, and of course, our inspector's dead now, uh, so he didn't live to see it. But but as Ed mentioned, you get this second guilty plea to federal crimes uh, just a few months ago, uh, late in the uh, in the Trump administration in November. Um, and so he was right. Like Spectre was right. This was not a deterrent. As for the Sacklers themselves, I, you know, look, I, my, my kind of dissatisfaction as a citizen, um, is, is pretty extensive here. And it, it's frankly, not just about the Sacklers. You got this guilty plea in November, uh, that was negotiated again, going over the heads of the line prosecutors. Uh, I, I report in the book that the prosecutors who actually built these cases were very unhappy with the outcome that a decision was made at political, at high political levels of the Trump administration, that there was going to be a soft touch was the quote that I heard, uh, for Purdue. So they end up getting this guilty plea. They say there's going to be $8 billion in fines, which is like a totally fake number, because if you're paying attention, you know that the company's in bankruptcy, right? If it was, if it was $8 billion and the Sacklers were on the hook for it, then you're, you're really talking real and money. And none of those articles about that mention that. It, it, was just like, it drives me crazy. And, and people still talk about the $8 billion. And I'm like, where is this $8 billion going to come from? You know, well, I, would get, I would get emails going, yay, good job for you putting the pressure on. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's not going anywhere. Yeah. So, so, and, and then the, the other thing that I found so particularly galling about this agreement is it's not just that the Sacklers aren't charged with anything. There's no individual executive from the company, not just who's charged, but like who's named. So you get this guilty plea for this conduct and there's all this paperwork associated with this and nobody can tell you the name of a single human being who made any decision. And I, Again, it's the emperor's new clothes thing where I'm just like, what is this the way it works? How is that? Who made these decisions? Who authorized them to do so? 
uh, I find it incredibly unsatisfying. Mm -hmm. In terms of the Sacklers, I mean, you know, Ed, it's, it's, I think that the, um, they have long claimed that they didn't really have much to do with what was going on at Purdue. You know, they, they just got briefed on decisions that have been made. They were this like checked out board. Um, you know, in reality, that's, that's clearly not true. <laughs> like I, I wrote a book documenting <laughs> the ways in which they were very, very, very involved. They've never really been able to answer those charges that in fact, they were kind of, you know, you have multiple CEOs complaining that the Sacklers are not letting them be the CEO of the company because they keep intervening. So to my mind, um, that's where the buck should stop. You know, not just with the people who are taking most of the wealth out at a time when the company's committing crimes, um, but also who are running the show, who are calling the shots. We now know. Um, I'm afraid that our system is designed in a way that that tends to insulate people like that from liability. Yeah. And I think that the Sacklers have played the system like a harp. I mean, they've really... Yeah. Yeah. They've taken advantage of every prerogative. So I, I, I hate to say it, but I don't I don't think we're going to see the kind of accountability that you um, that you might have in mind. Ed. It, it seems like there is some momentum building, particularly around um, this this House bill. Uh, that was introduced by Congresswoman uh, Maloney uh, a couple months ago called um, Stop Shielding Assets from Corporate Known Liability by Eliminating Non-Debtor Releases, a.k.a. the Sackler Act. Somebody said, how many staffers and how many cocktails did it come take to come up with that acronym? Uh, <laughs> what, what, does, does it have a snowball's chance, the Sackler Act? You know, I don't, I, so, so for, by way of background, for, for people who, who may not, um, may not be up on this, the, the way this whole thing looks likely to end is that what the Sacklers have proposed is when Purdue comes out of bankruptcy, it'll become a kind of a public trust. Effectively, it'll keep selling OxyContin, but the proceeds from those sales will go to helping the states fight the opioid crisis. A little bit weird, the idea that you you fight the opioid crisis with funds raised by selling the drug that helped kick off the opioid crisis. But even so, that's what they're proposing. They're proposing that they pay uh, just over $4 billion to help remediate the crisis, that they admit no wrongdoing, and that they be released, that the judge, the bankruptcy judge, release them from any of these future lawsuits. So like all of the states that are suing the Sacklers, about 25 states, that are suing them personally, they would basically be told by this federal bankruptcy judge, sorry, you know, you're out of luck here. They made this contribution and I'm going to give them a, a permanent get out of jail free card. There is this bill in the house, the Sackler act, and which I think will soon be introduced in the Senate. Um, and what this would do is, is basically say like, no, a federal bankruptcy judge cannot uh, release from future litigation parties who haven't declared bankruptcy in his court. Like they, you know, they've got 10 plus billion dollars. Uh, they're not declaring bankruptcy. So on what grounds does this judge get to, um, to release them from any of these future suits? It's hard for me to tell in terms of whether it has a snowball's chance in hell. They, they have not found a Republican co-sponsor yet. I think a lot of Republican state attorney generals want to see this deal go through. And so it may be that there's a kind of there's some partisan pressure preventing House members from signing on. But, Beth, I, I know you watched, um, as I did, this amazing congressional hearing that um, the chairwoman Maloney organized in December, where they hauled two of the Sacklers uh, in front of Congress. Um, and I thought there was a really fascinating dynamic there where a number of the Republican this, this was a uh, you know, it's it's a it's obviously a bipartisan committee. Um, the Democrats had really pushed to hold the hearing. A number of the Republicans expressed misgivings about the fact that they were holding a hearing at all. They clearly kind of didn't want to be there and didn't want to be like forcing the Sacklers to answer questions under oath about their conduct. But then you saw this amazing thing where as they were asking their questions, 
one after another, the Republican House members started asking like really tough, righteous questions. And I think speaking up for their constituents. And to me, this was kind of democracy in action because there may have been like a little bit of kind of partisan pressure on them to go easy on the Sacklers. But I think on the other side, they had their constituents. And these people come from uh, states and regions that have been hit very, very hard by this crisis and this drug. And you could tell. And by the end of the hearing, um, I think it was the ranking member, uh, but one of the Re Republican uh, House members said, you know, there's not a lot on this committee that we agree on in a bipartisan way. But one is that, the, you know, this family's behavior has been really atrocious. And that's the one thing that makes me think that um, there might be a way for that bill to go through. Is but that I'm told it has to get on, right? Because, uh, like, it takes so much time to get through both does. chambers and... Totally. And the weirdness, you know, the, unfortunately, the weirdness with the legislative process is that when it looks like this kind of thing is going to happen, suddenly you get all these people who've like got they've got their own little pet issues that they want to try and get in. There. The more bells and whistles they hang on this thing, the less likely it is to pass. Yeah. Yeah. I had some craft questions, but it looks like we're getting um, low on time. We've got four minutes left. And I, I do want to um, end with a couple questions about what's next uh, for you. Um I know there are a couple of TV shows in the works about the opioid crisis, including one based on my book, Dope Sick, that's coming out later this year on Hulu. Um, there's a Netflix series in the works that I think you might perhaps be working on. Could you talk about that a bit? Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not working on it um, in a kind of active way. I am, I am um, uh, it's based in, um, it's based on Barry Meyer's book, Painkiller. It's gonna be called Painkiller. It's also uh, somewhat based on my article from 2017. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, Peter Berg is a great director. He's gonna direct all the episodes. Um, it is uh, in the works and I, I think, you know, potentially uh, going to going to shoot fairly soon. Um, I don't have the, the latest in terms of, um, you know, what what the status is right now. Yeah. Uh, great. And there's exactly. also a documentary that I think you consulted with coming out in May by Alex Gibney. Um, so I guess the last question, what's your hope going forward as this story, the crime of the century, as Gibney calls it, um, our projects, um, your book, other journalism, as it becomes, as the story becomes more deeply set in the public's mind, could public opinion sway the outcome in the actual courts. And I'm talking not just about the Purdue bankruptcy, but we also have this MDL and some test cases that are getting, you know, sent back to states. It seems like, I don't know, I said before, I feel like there's a bit of momentum going. What, what's your thinking that, that this work could help with that? I mean, I, you know, I th look, the hard thing is that the, if you look at the, what the, if you look at the magnitude of the damage and the cost of 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 um, kind of remediation, um, you could have every lawsuit under the sun win, you know, end in a in a total triumph, and there's just never going to be enough money, honestly, to address the problem. And so, I you know, I think that it, it may be that you see um, that you see more of these companies willing to settle and settle in a significant way. Um, but you know, it's not going to be like the tobacco settlement because the reality is that all of the opioid makers combined just don't have that kind of money that we saw in the tobacco settlement. <clears throat> um, so that's a kind of dismaying, I hate to say it, but that's a sort of a dismaying reality for me in terms of the work that I do. Um, it's really more about the historical record. I mean, I think, you know, there's a, there's a quote um, I have in the, in the book from, um, from David Kessler, who was the head of the FDA uh, when OxyContin was approved. And, and he said that, um, that the destigmatization of opioids uh, that happened during the 1990s really, you know, for which OxyContin was the catalyst. He said it was one of the great mistakes of modern medicine, um, which is not to say opioids should never be prescribed, but they should be prescribed carefully and not just to anyone uh, in a reckless fashion. Um, and, uh, you know, for me, it's partially just understanding the decisions and the history um, and trying to make a record of it so that we can learn from it, I hope, um, and, and not repeat these kinds of mistakes again. Absolutely, especially during the pandemic when you now have a record 
overdose deaths going. Um, but I think we're out of time now. And I just wanted to thank you, Patrick. Thanks to C-SPAN 2 and Book TV for having us both on. And thanks to you all for, for reading the books. Keep it on. Keep on. <laughs> thank you for doing this, Pat. Yeah. Afterwards is a weekly hour-long discussion with current nonfiction authors. Find it and follow wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you.